Last week, we looked at Psalm 139 and particularly focused on David's statement there that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, or as he puts it in the psalm, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He speaks in the first person, but he speaks for all of us as himself, but not only for himself, but for every man and woman that's ever been mourned. I, he said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, knit together. He knit me together in my mother's womb. And as I pointed out last week, taking the language of creation, of Adam being formed from the dust of the earth directly and intentionally by the very hand of God, and he uses that creational instance to speak of the formation of just one among millions, in his case, of human beings being born in those days and says, nevertheless, that God had a direct and immediate hand in the putting together of David in his mother's womb. We looked at that last week, and what he says about himself is not only true for David, it's true for every one of us. And so I want to just take a few minutes this morning to look more in depth about what it means when David says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And what are some of the implications of that? And so we're not going to look again at Psalm 139 as our text for this morning. We're going to go instead to the very first chapter of the Bible, to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to begin reading at verse 20. In the beginning of the fifth day of creation. And... As we move on, you'll see why I want to begin there. But on the first day, God created light. On the second day, he separates the waters above the heavens from the waters beneath the heavens and so forth. And now on the fourth day, he says, let the waters, beginning at verse 20, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And so God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, fill the seas, and let the birds fill, multiply on the earth. And there was evening and morning the fifth day. And God said, that the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the ground. And Heavenly Father, we pray that in these next few moments, as we look into your word, that your Holy Spirit would so attend and accompany us, that we might first of all be able to share something of the insight into the truth that you've given us, and then also to expand each of our understandings about these important and fundamental realities regarding who we are and why we're here. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> I couldn't help but remark your clerk of session in his pastoral prayer this morning, uh, asking for prayer for the nation and that uh, the citizens of the nation would have enough wisdom and discernment to elect godly people concerned to enforce a godly agenda in order that we might be a righteous nation. The Bible says that 
Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. And yet the truth of the matter is that over the course of my life, and I'm now 70, so over the course of 70 years, I've watched the nation move by degree, almost without turning, in the direction of sin time after time after time. And I alluded last week to the possibility that the Roe versus Wade decision might be reversed. And I said that it was a glimmer of divine light in the midst of darkness, and I can only pray that that glimmer would become reality. Because life is God. God is life. And all life emanates from him and comes from him and is a gift from him, including human life in general and including your life in particular. And so we want to look into the word of God again. Using this time, Genesis chapter 1, the creation narrative, to understand something more about what it means to be alive, what it means to be made in the image of God. And, and so first of all, let me point, point out the very first thing that this text clearly shows as over against everything that you and I learned in all of our science classes from at least the middle elementary years and that all of your children are learning in most of their science classes unless you're sending them to intentionally Christian school. And even then, not always clearly. And that is this, that humanity is created by God as a unique species. The very first thing and the most fundamental thing that we can derive out of Genesis chapter 1 is that God created humanity as a unique species. What does that mean then? If that's true, what it means is that man cannot have evolved out of the ooze, no matter how much time, no matter how many lightning strikes, that's not how it happened. That's not how it happened. Look again at the text. God in verse 20, and this is why I wanted to begin back there, day four. Day four, God creates the sea creatures. Everything from the little goldfish to the giant whale and everything in between, he made the sea creatures. He also makes the birds on that day. And then on the sixth day, he begins by making all of the life, the animal life that moves on the earth, beginning at verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and so forth. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds. Then we move to verse 26, and what do we read? Then God said, let us make, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over. Now, if the text means anything, if the word of God can be taken to have any intrinsic value, any meaningful meaning, if there's any truth to be had here, one inescapable truth is that when God created the material universe. He created human beings as a specific species. So no evolutionary, creational evolutionary construct that sees man as just moving out of the ooze or moving forward from the ape or whatever you will. That's not how it happened. Secondly, it also means that in the contemporary sense, we're not going anywhere. The human species was created as a human species and has continued to be and will continue to be a human species, whether we stay here or establish a colony on Mars or on the moon or whatever. We're going to be human beings. And it also means those of you who may be listening to the news, that the notion that Elon Musk and Mrs. Elon Musk and others are putting forward that through technology, 
man is going to advance beyond himself, that humanity is going to become something new, something other, something better, that also is going to prove to be a chimera, a false promise. It will not, it will not come about as they hope. Yes, technology can implant a device in the human brain that will allow, uh, say, a war veteran who lost a leg and who has a new artificial leg or lost an arm and has a new artificial arm. There are neuro devices that they can implant in those men and women that, will, that allow them to much more, um, have much more functionality and manipulative ability with that artificial limb than they would have otherwise. But, and they are developing technology that will allow them to plant a chip in your brain that will increase, they say, and probably true, your uh, memory capacity, your ability to absorb and so forth. But if they can create such a chip, they can also control such a chip. And once that happens, what you will then have increasingly is a society of men and women controlled and manipulated not by the Spirit of God and by their conscience, but controlled and manipulated by a this-world humanity that has no notion of God's standards of right and wrong. And we'll see in a minute uh, even more why that's a problem, but don't let me get ahead of myself. The only thing I want to establish at this point, out of the text of Genesis chapter 1, if it means anything at all, it means that God established you and you and you and me as a specific species and that we did not evolve, have not evolved, and that we are made as we are because God wants us this way for very specific reasons, and we're going to get to those as we go forward. But the second thing that this text also quite clearly shows is that God created humans, and I'm going to start using that word instead of man. God created humans in his image and after his likeness as a unique species in two genders, that man's gender identity is binary, and that binary gender identity is God-given and God-determined. Notice again what we read in this most basic text, Genesis chapter 26, the language of the scriptures. God said, let us make man, or we might say humanity. Nevertheless, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and so forth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now that's fascinating because if you go back to verse 20 and look at the establishment of the sea creatures, we read about the sea creatures that he said, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the sea. He said of the birds, be fruitful, multiply, fill the sea, but he never discusses how that's going to happen. There's no mention of male and female whales, male and female sea creatures, male and female birds of any kind. He doesn't discuss gender. But when he comes to the human, to the human being, he simply says, what? You are one species in two genders, male and female. And my friends, if there was ever a point in history where that needs emphasis and that reality makes sense and that reality is true, it's for us right now. One, um, sorry, one species in two genders, and therefore we conclude that biological gender identity is a God-given reality. In every case, to be embraced by men and women, boys and girls, and certainly to be affirmed by any who would set themselves up to teach the young. But instead, in the present moment, we have a movement today that urges the questioning of this most foundational aspect of what it means to be a human being. I can't, I'm sure that you have heard that teachers are meeting with students 
in private clubs at school to talk about openness of gender identity and challenging young people who are struggling with the, the fundamental question that every young, people, young person does, who am I and why am I here? And they struggle with that at fundamental levels, as they should. That's, what, that's one of the things they need to work through. Who am I and why am I here? And when life gets tough, why are bad things happening to me? These are all questions that d require answers. The great thing about the Word of God is the Word of God has answers for those kinds of questions. That's why I wanted to take a moment and look at some of these things this morning because the Word of God speaks directly to these things. These teachers and others who are engaged in this kind of undermining process are engaged in a great evil. The Word of God says that if you're a human being, you're a human being as a male or a human being as a female, and you are so because that's what God wanted. And not only do we see it in Genesis at the very beginning, the formation of all things, we see it from the lips of Jesus himself. And if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees ask Jesus about divorce. And when they do, Jesus responds to the Pharisees, first of all, not on the question of divorce, but on the issue of marriage in toto. And he says, we'll pick up at the first verse of uh, Matthew 19. Now, when Jesus finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond Jordan, and large crowds followed him and healed them there. So this didn't take place in a vacuum. This took place in front of many hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. And the Pharisees, uh, the most legalistic party of the Jewish people, came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce a wife for any cause? And he answered, and note, he doesn't address the divorce question initially. He starts to talk about marriage. He said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them, made them what? Male and female. He made them, say it again, male, male and female. He made them? Male and female. You see that? Matthew 19. Do you see that? Thousands of years after Genesis 1. 1,500 years after Moses wrote Genesis, the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his earthly ministry, as a prelude to a, a fulsome discussion of marriage and its sanctity, before he even addresses the divorce question, the very first thing that he talks about is the nature of humanity. And he said, don't you remember that at the beginning, how did he make them? A binary reality. And then in Psalm 139, if we take that information and we go back once more to Psalm 139, just very quickly, we can see get an even deeper perspective on what David is then celebrating in those central verses where he says, beginning at verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb, certainly, certainly, certainly to include his sexual identity. Who is knitting his sexual identity together in his mother's womb? God is. What makes him a male? Who makes him a male? God does. And if it were a woman writing and celebrating her being knit together in her mother's womb, she'd be celebrating her femininity. And who would have made her female? God would have made her female. So you see, if God has made you male, if God has made you female, if he has made you a boy or a girl, a son or a daughter, you see, he doesn't just make children. And he doesn't just make people. He makes men. He makes women. That gender binary reality is there from Genesis all the way to Jesus' teaching in Matthew and is celebrated by David in Psalm 139. Knitted together in my mother's womb. 
Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. God, David is saying, God had a direct hand in making me as me, me as me. Listen, man, you say, I wish I was somebody else. We've all had those feelings. At one time or another, most of us in our lives have had that. I wish I were somebody else. Wish I were somebody else. But don't, don't wish that. Say, Lord, I'm struggling. But I thank you that you made me me. Now, Father, I pray that your spirit would show me why you made me me. Why you made me me. And let me rejoice in me. Father, show me why you made me me. And he will. He will if you will follow him. And so we can conclude from this text then that all humanity, both men and women, boys and girls, are made in the image of God. And so in the few minutes I have remaining, I want to take some time to talk more at length about what it means to be made in the image of God. I mean, after all, that's, that's a pretty expressive phrase, image of God. So what does it mean? Well, first of all, let, let's clear up what it doesn't mean. And this, by the way, is one of, the, one of the lessons that we use in our global pastor training exercise to help our pastors, uh, serving pastors in other countries, be able to talk more intelligently to their congregations about how God made them and why they made them and what it means to be made in the image of God. And the first thing we say is it doesn't mean that we look like God. Because as Jesus told the woman at the well in John chapter 4, God is what? God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, we are, visibly speaking, we are a body, imbued with a spirit, but we are a body. So when we say we're made in the image of God, we, first of all, we don't, it doesn't mean that we look like God. No one has seen God at any time. But what does it mean? So it doesn't mean we look like God. What does it mean? Well, I want to give you five thoughts about that. The first thought is simply this, that because we're made in the image of God, we are spiritual beings. We have a soul. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, do not fear man who has the power to destroy the body. Rather, fear God who has the power to cast both soul and body into hell. You see, from the perspective of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not a material being only. You do not simply consist of this flesh and your skeleton and the rest of you physically, but that you are intrinsically a spiritual being. And that of the two, they both matter but that of the two, by far, the more important element is the eternal element. Do not fear man who can only kill the body, but fear God who has the power to cast both soul and body into hell. In other words, it is only God who has control over our spiritual destiny and over our spiritual nature. Bad things happen in a lost and broken world, and our physical bodies may experience that. But God controls our eternal destiny. He controls our spiritual destiny. We are made in the image of God, and therefore we are a creature with a body and a soul. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into him the breath of life, and man became a living being. In other words, something of the divine was imparted to him at creation. Secondly, to be made in the image of God means that humans are rational beings capable of thinking out solutions to problems. Now, Debbie and I, have, we have two little white dogs at our house They're named Teddy and Rosie. They're little Bichon Frise, if you happen to know what those are. Years ago, I told Debbie, she, she and John, when John was small, they started bugging me about wanting a dog. And I said, yeah, okay, what, do you want a Rottweiler, a German Shepherd, do, you know, do you want a Russian Wolfhound? What, 
what kind of dog do you, I, let's get a dog. You know, I want a dog, dog, dog. And Debbie said, no, I, that's not the kind of dog I want. I want a dog that we can keep in the house and that, you know, one of those kind of dogs. I said, man, I don't want a dog like that. <laughs> but we had a four-year-old son. Daddy, can we get a dog? Nah, nah, we're not going to get a dog. Daddy, can't we get a dog? I want a dog. So guess what? We got a dog, and we got the kind that Debbie wanted, a little fluffy white dog, and John loved him. But then John went off to kindergarten the next year, and guess what? The dog's home alone by himself. you believe this? So he, we take him to the, to the vet. What's the matter with the dog? He doesn't want to eat. He doesn't want to run. He doesn't want to play. He's only two years old. What's the deal with the dog? Oh, the dog's depressed. What? Yeah. Well, what's the solution? Doggy therapy? No, no, no. The solution, the solution was dogs are pack animals and he needs a companion. And I said, yeah, you got to be kidding me, man. No way. I didn't want one dog. And you're telling me the solution to this mutt's unhappiness is another mutt? Guess what we did? We got two dogs. And they were happy from that point forward. And now they died years ago, and we got two more, Teddy and Rosie. And, you know, Teddy, when I have a sandwich, Teddy and Rosie, they come running to the refrigerator. And because uh, they get treats from me. And if I'm having ham and Swiss cheese, then they love the Swiss cheese. And so, guys, sit. And they sit, and they get a bite of Swiss cheese. Stand. And they come up on their hind legs, and they get their Swiss cheese. They can lay down. They can roll over. They can do all kinds. Boy, aren't those dogs smart. But now we have a little three-year-old daughter. Granddaughter. Granddaughter. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a three-year-old granddaughter. <laughs> thank you. See, that's why she's here. A three-year-old granddaughter. And... I can say to my three-year-old granddaughter, hey, Naya, how much is one plus one? Oh, Pops, two. Well, Naya, how much is two plus two? Four. How much is three plus two? Five. She can do that all the way up to about ten already at three. Teddy and Rosie, who are now eight and nine years old. Teddy and Rosie, how much is one plus one? Where's my cheese? <laughs> they can't do that. People talk about whales talking, right? Eight divided by four equals? Can a whale give an answer to that question? They can't. They can't. But we can. Why? Because we are made in the image of God, and because we are made in the image of God, we are rational beings capable of thinking out solutions to problems. Last night, I had the privilege, literally, of talking with a rocket scientist who had retired from NASA, who was involved in NASA back in the day, you know. Yeah, what? Yeah, the beginning of time, yes. Yeah, back in the day. And, I, I mean, just, you know, five minutes, and, and I, he had already lost me. I can barely remember the quadratic equation, you know. But he was off to the races. Why? Because whether he would acknowledge it or not, he's made in the image of God. And because he is made in the image of God, he is a rational being capable of thinking out solutions to problems. Third, because we are made in the image of God, we are moral beings capable of discerning the difference between right and wrong. After nearly 50 years of Roe versus Wade, a larger percentage of American people today are convinced that abortion is wrong than were 50 years ago because they've seen the ultrasounds, they've seen the evidence of life in the womb, and so forth and so on. When confronted with those kinds of facts, some decisions are right and some decisions are wrong. It's not always the easy decision that's right. 
And most of the time, the easy decision is wrong. You have to make hard decisions, tough choices. How do we evaluate? How do we know? To the extent that we do know and to the extent that we can evaluate, we are able to do so because we are moral beings made in the image of God. And if you say, how can I inform my moral being? You can inform your moral being, first of all, by learning the Ten Commandments if you don't already know them. Because the moral being, of the, of the Ten Commandments summarize the moral law, the law of God, which he gave to Moses and to his people. And Moses celebrated afterwards by saying, the hidden things belong to our God, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children forever. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do you know the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath that you should bow down to it and worship it. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not lie. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Build those moral values into your hearts and lives and into the hearts and lives of your children. Does that mean they won't sin? No, they're still going to sin. They're going to intentionally violate those standards. But when they do, they'll know that they violated them. And then tell them the gospel, and they'll know where they can get help for their sin. We'll get to that in just a moment. But to press on in the image of God, we are spiritual beings, rational beings, moral beings. Because we are made in the image of God, number four, human beings are called to exercise dominion over the lower creation. We're to manage the natural resources wisely, prudently, intelligently, carefully. That's a sermon in itself, but that's the truth. And then finally, because we are made in the image of God, human beings are everlasting beings. God is eternal. You remember your timelines from math class or your mathematical lines? God is a line. The line has an arrow this way and an arrow this way. No beginning and no end. Well, that's God's life. A line segment. Life begins here and ends here. Well, that's the life of the fish in the sea. It comes into being. It exists for a certain period of time, and then it ceases to exist. There's no heaven, no eternity for the fish. But there's a third kind of line, isn't there? It's called a ray. A ray has a definite beginning point. It then moves forward and continues in that direction in perpetuity. That, my friends, defines a human life. We are born into this world. We live. There is a point at which we experience physical death, and that then becomes an important point on that line, but that's not the end of the line. We move past that into eternity, either into eternal fellowship with God or into eternal separation from God and eternal torment. The grave is not the end of human life. We are everlasting beings because we are made in the image of God. Therefore, every human being alive today must face three important truths need to face the truth about God. There is a God. He is there. He made you in his image and after his likeness, and he is absolutely perfect and absolutely sinless, and he lives in a heaven where there is no sin. Hallelujah. We need to face the truth about ourselves. We, all of us, we are sinful. We're born because of the fall. We're born with sinful, imperfect hearts. And we do things that violate God's holy standard. We choose to sin. 
And so the great dilemma is that how can I, with my dirty heart, enter into the presence of God where there is no sin? And that takes us to the truth about Jesus. Because God had said long ago, if I could find just one man without any sin, and if that one man would be willing to lay down his life on behalf of all the rest, then I would accept his sinless death on their behalf if they would come to me through him. See, those are the realities. That's the truth of the gospel message. You say, well, what can I do? You can take three simple steps. First of all, admit you're a sinner. Admit you're a sinner. Secondly, believe on Jesus. That when Jesus came into the world, he's the only sinless man that ever lived. He didn't need to die. He lived the life that we failed to live. He died the death that we deserve to die. So that if we place our faith and trust in him, he becomes our substitute. His righteousness is imputed to us. His death is accounted as full and sufficient payment for our sin and our dirty hearts. And we then find that fellowship with God is restored and access to heaven is renewed. Not because of anything, any righteousness which we have done, but because of the cross work and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so today, if you have heard this message and desire to come to Christ and to be that new person, you can simply pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin as the only sinless man that ever lived. Come into my life. Take control of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. I admit I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And if you're already in Christ, then I hope this message encourages you strengthens you in your determination about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the implications of it for the day in which you live, brothers and sisters. And so let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your work at creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and after your likeness. Moral beings, rational beings, everlasting beings, and so the implications of our decision in this life have eternal consequences. Grant, therefore, Heavenly Father, that every young man and woman in this room, every older man and woman in this room, and not leave here today without having measured and evaluated the cross work and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and their need for a Savior, and having come to him, being found having no righteousness of their own, only that which comes by faith in Christ, that they too may be renewed and find themselves in that great company of believers who continues to grow and go forward even in the midst of a rebellious and wicked world. And so, Lord, let us shine as lights in a dark place. Let us not hide our candles, but let us proclaim proudly and boldly that we are followers of God Almighty, made in his image and after his likeness. Amen.